Worried about your home's furnace or AC? Not anymore. Legacy Heating and Air wants to make it easy for you to stay comfortable year-round. Right now, when you buy a new heating and cooling system from Legacy, we'll give you the complete package worry-free. Get a free smart thermostat, a free duct cleaning, flexible financing, and free maintenance for up to 12 years. This deal won't last long. Call your Legacy Pro today or schedule online at LegacyHeatingAndAirInc.com. A Cook Family Business. Welcome to Football Never Sleeps, brought to you by Legacy Heating and Air, with the emphasis on air today, since we have such a nice day in South Bend, Indiana. My name is Eric Hansen, as my little name tag suggests. He's Tyler James, and this is Football Never Sleeps, the weekly Notre Dame football YouTube show that runs year-round, usually on Monday night between 7 and 8 Eastern time. And we've got lots to talk about today. We're in the final stretch of spring football with the blue gold game set for Notre Dame Stadium on Saturday, a really cool semi-closed scrimmage this past Saturday at Notre Dame Stadium, all kinds of recruiting stuff. The transfer portal reopens tomorrow, so we got all that fun coming. And Tyler James is here to tell you how to participate with us in the show. You can ask questions during the show. You can ring bells. You can hit likes, and he'll tell you how to do all those things. Yeah, hit the bell for reminders of when we have content coming. Hit the like button to show support for the show. Uh, make sure you subscribe to us here on the Inside Indy Sports YouTube channel. Um, and if you want to ask questions, make sure you've clicked through either to YouTube's website or app to make sure that you can do so. You won't be able to do so if you're watching us um, on social media or embedded somewhere else. So make sure you've clicked through. The comment and chat section should be on the right-hand side if you're on a desktop of some sort. If you're on a mobile device, the comments should be below us. So hopefully you don't have any issues fi finding that. Um, we have a new promotion uh, available to first-time subscribers for InsideIndieSports.com. Um, if you uh, buy one month, you can get three additional months for free. All you have to do is use the promo code NDSPRING24 when you sign up to get access to our premium analysis and recruiting coverage and special access to us over on the Insider Lounge where we spend a lot of our time and share our inside information first. There's a link to sign up for that in the video description below. You can find a, a banner for it on our website, insideindiesports.com. So um, if you are considering subscribing to us, it's a good time to do it. This will take you through the summer. Plenty of recruiting coverage to come. Obviously, we're wrapping up spring here, portal action. Um, some NFL men's draft. NFL draft, men's basketball, women's basketball, recruiting and portal action. Um, so lots of stuff to be to be monitoring here in these next four months. So this is a good deal that you should uh, really consider taking care, advantage of. And if you're saying, what's happening in June? Gosh, recruiting official visits and barbecues at Tyler's house. So <laughs> we're going to... <laughs> We're gonna get, that's not part of the subscription. You have to be. Yeah, that, you, you do not get that if you put Pro ND Spring 24 in. That does not come with that. <laughs> okay. So we are taking stock of Notre Dame football after Saturday's Jersey scrimmage, which wasn't in New Jersey. I'll explain the format a little bit later at Notre Dame Stadium. So Notre Dame held its 11th of 15 spring practices on Saturday with the defense winning the 53. 32 battle with the offense uh, in a format that consisted of a little bit more than 80 plays and a weird scoring system that I don't even understand. But you could tell the eye test said the defense won the scrimmage. So they get to wear blue practice jerseys for the rest of this spring, all summer, I guess, if they want to, to the grocery store, and then in practices this fall all the way to next spring. The Blue Gold game, which is the spring football finale, is set for 1 o'clock on Saturday at Notre Dame Stadium. It'll be streaming on Peacock. And so we're going to start our opening drive tonight with the position groups with something to prove at Saturday's Blue Gold game. So this will be a traditional game with a player draft on Thursday morning, and maybe we can, Tyler, put the YouTube link in for that at some point during the yeah. show so people yeah, can watch the draft at 9 15 a.m on thursday there will be some modifications but it's going to be straight scoring you won't have to learn the stable Ford system for football uh there will also be plenty of football alums back on campus this weekend because 
They're doing the legacy weekend again, which has been so great for recruiting, but also for the current players and for the alums. Getting to connect and feel more a part of the program has been a big deal. Um, So, Tyler, my first question to you is, based on what we've seen through the first 11 practices, including Saturday's scrimmage, which position groups do you feel have the most to prove? Um, I I came up with three that – in my opinion, have the most to prove. One's the offensive line. Um, I, I think it's probably more individually than as a group, but I think the whole group needs to continue to improve. Um, the linebacker group, um, What can we see what their strengths are? This is the first, I mean, other than the scrimmage that we got to see, um, first time getting to see a lot of these guys tackle for, for many people, uh, guys that are being put in more in actual real positions. Um, and even for us, I mean, the, the scrimmage on Saturday was the first time we were able to see guys like Kingston Villiamuasa um, uh, running around tackling guys, and and even even someone like Drake Bowen. I mean, they got Drake got a little bit of playing time last year, but um, expected to take a big bigger role next year. Um, and then the wide receivers, uh, who are the playmakers? Jaden Greathouse looked good in the Saturday scrimmage. I think he's looked good all spring. Um, still waiting for someone to really flash. Like I, I liked Chris Mitchell. Um, he was more of a possession receiver than a big playmaker in the scrimmage that we saw, but it, it can, are there, are there people that can make plays in that wide receiver group? Th- so those are the big positions that I'm most focused on. I, I, I know it'll be hard to tell because they're not going to be all like, especially the offensive line, the all five off starting offensive linemen or projected starting offensive linemen aren't going to be playing together. So you don't, you won't get the same sort of sense for what it could be in the fall. But when you study what they're doing individually, um, that should give you more opportunity to um, see how those guys are progressing. And the offensive tackles specifically is a position that I've been uh, hard on and I, w- I want to see uh, um, some more improvement on. So hopefully Charles Jagusa and Emil Wagner and Tosh Baker have, have good days. Yeah, I'm. I think that's a good point. I wonder how much – we're going to be able to gauge in the blue gold game. I'm glad we have the context of the Jersey scrimmage because I, I, I don't want to say we were that departed from vanilla offense, but we were departed from vanilla defense. Um, Mm -hmm. I thought we got to see clear competitive periods that gave us a little bit more context. The defense should be ahead of the offense for a lot of reasons. One, because they return more starters uh, they also don't have a new coordinator. They're not learning a new playbook. Um, and they were the number five team in total defense last year, number one in pass efficiency defense. So I do think you'll be able to tell some. I don't think definitively, but I think you'll be able to gain some impressions if you kind of uh, keep it in perspective. The three position groups I went with were two of the same ones you did. I had offensive line and again it's going to be mixed up wide receivers you're going to have different quarterbacks thrown to them which i actually think is good and then i'm going to put the quarterbacks themselves in this category sure. especially after what we saw in the jersey scrimmage i thought you know of the three quarterbacks that did play and riley leonard was on the field kind of shadowing everything i thought cj carr had the most poise. Now, again, he didn't have to go against the number one defense, but he did go against the twos at, at, at points. Um, and, and it's not like Kenny Minchie and Steve Angeli look bad, but I think, again, in front of a big crowd and the context of the blue-gold game, I, I'm i really curious to see those guys play and step up and show that this does deserve to be a competition, which it will be anyways. I mean, right. Marcus isn't going to go, well, guys, guys, you didn't look good enough. So Riley Leonard is the starter just based on default. You know, they're going to play this through the summer and we're going to go into fall camp before we have an official starter name. Mm. But I do think we can gain some insight from how they perform in front of a crowd of, we'll guess, around 35,000 on Saturday. Yeah, I think... Like Steve Angeli, if he if he's supposed to challenge Riley Leonard for the job, he should be able to go out in the blue gold game and have success. Like there shouldn't be like I don't think it should matter whether the defense is more advanced than the offense or if he's not behind a full starting offensive line. 
if he's challenging to be a starting quarterback, you should be able to find success um, in a, in a scrimmage setting like that. I think he did some good things um, in the scrimmage we saw this past Saturday, but he had the two interceptions, which obviously you, you can't have. Um, and so he, had, he was a bit up and down um, in that scrimmage. So uh, the goal would be the next time out we see him is to cut down on those mistakes. And that's something as someone we're evaluating as everyone sees him at the end of games last year, and then obviously the full game against Oregon state and the Sun Bowl, you don't see, you don't get to see Steve Angeli in a big sample size. So those mistakes don't show up maybe when you're, when you're, you're playing for eight plays at the end of a game or something like that. So that's, that's the stuff that we don't necessarily know about Steve Angeli, given that he just has a, a lack of playing time in his career. And the more we get to see you, you, you learn if, is he, is he prone to do stuff like this? There's just a one-off um, and you get a better sense for how, and how he handles that. And, and then how he sort of bounce backs from bounces back from that as well. Yeah, the and again, I would say the version of the def, Notre Dame defense he faced. Now again, he didn't have a Ben Morrison out there, for example. But I still think that defense is better than what he faced of the watered down Oregon State version in the Sun Bowl. But that still was a decent defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's a lot to learn about Steve Angeli, Tyler. Before we get into the next segment, do we want to take a few questions here? Yeah, we can certainly do that. I got a bunch of questions here. Um, Brian Habermill asks, can you describe it with whatever detail you are allowed to that pass from CJ Carter, Cam Williams, that Notre Dame featured in a Twitter promo looked like a slant or a skinny post in breaking route on target. Do you remember the play? I know what he's talking about. Do you remember? Go ahead. I, I remember it somewhat. I remember saying, wow, Cam Williams. And that was a nice play. That wasn't on the same drive. I mean, CJ Carr had a couple scoring drives. One he ran in. This this was the touchdown. Yeah, this uh, was the touchdown pass in the corner, right corner, the corner closest to us in the on the right side of the field, going yeah. left to right. Yeah, as they like not, to say on radio. None of that matters to anyone because they didn't get to see it. But yeah, uh, but we're but, trying to ch- <laughs> check and make sure we're talking. I'll let you describe the play. Yeah, so I, I think it was an early read. I don't think it was. I think he read that from the beginning. Like that's where he wanted to go with the ball, from my recollection. Now that's the downside of this scrimmage. Like we don't have a taping of it or, or film, so we can't even like in the game. Uh, I go back and rewatch the game and and learn some different things and can confirm or deny some of the things that I may have thought I saw. Um, so yeah, it was just a slant route. He beat chance Tucker uh, or more of a, a, more of a post route than a slant route um, beat chance Tucker down the middle. There was, I don't know that there was really a safety that made a difference in the play. I don't know what the coverage was necessarily, um, but looked like a good read. CJ Carr stepped up. I think there was some pressure coming at him and he delivered a guy was a beautiful ball and right on the money for Cam Williams. And um I think it just sort of uh, showed what CJ. I think that's sort of emblematic of what CJ Carr was doing. Like he was, he throws a pretty ball. He was making good decisions. Um, there was another player earlier where he, maybe I don't remember if it was earlier or after, to be honest. He like motioned to Cam Williams, like, hey, come here. And then Cam Williams starts coming back when he's rolling out of the pocket and he throws to him on the sideline for a completion. So um, a lot of poise that we saw from CJ Carr. Um, in the in that in that spring game and that 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 touchdown pass was was another example. It's going to be curious how they split those guys up. I would imagine Minchi will play for one side and Angeli for the other side. I don't know if they're going to have CJ Carr play for both sides and then play that running clock second half. But uh, I hope that he does get some reps against the better competition because the usual it's usually deep reserves and so forth in that second half. Yeah. Bob, Bob Alvey asked based off what you've seen from CJ Carr has his play thus far earned first team reps. I'd like to see them in the blue gold game, but I, I mean, I don't think he's in competition for to be the starter, but I am curious what, what his reps will look like in the fall. I mean, you're going to have to get conceivably four guys reps in practice. And I think he's a guy that I think will compete for the starting spot in 2025. So you want to 
continue to develop him. Now, what's better for him to learn the Notre Dame offense and not get very many reps or to be a scout team quarterback sometimes, get lots of reps, but not in the Notre Dame offense. So um, that's going to be interesting. But I will say this, he played above my expectations on Saturday. Yeah, I mean, if we're just looking at, like, what's the rest of the week look like leading into the blue-gold game, right? They have they have some more practices before they get to the Saturday scrimmage. Yeah, they jammed a bunch of them in this week. Um, I would say it would be fair to say Steve Angeli gets, what, 50% of the first team reps, and then you split the second team or the, the rest of the 50% between Minchie and Carr? Like, I don't know that you're going to, like, Carr's not going to take more reps with the first team than Minchie will. will. I think it would probably be a split at best. Um, and, and, and Jelly's going to continue to take the most. Um, so I, I, I guess it depends on what you, you see. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen when we get to the fall um, when Riley Leonard comes back, unless you have a big uh, gap in the roster due to some transfer portal activity. But um, I, I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves to say CJ Carr deserves first team reps. I like, I, I can agree with Eric when you're like, yeah, it'd be nice to see him. What does he look like against the higher competition? But I don't know that's, I, I, it's not necessarily what Notre Dame needs going into next season. Like that's not something they're counting on. Um, but anything that you can help the development of CJ Carr is something that you're going to want to, to continue to do because he does have such a bright future. And, and there were times I'll, I'll be critical a little bit of Brian Kelly here. There were times where they would take that number three or number four quarterback and that all they would do is scout team reps. And then, they'd be competing to be the start of the next season. And Brian Kelly, well, they were on the scout team, so they don't know our offense. And it's like, whoa, well, shouldn't there have been some middle ground there a little bit? I think with Marcus and with Tom, when Tommy Reese was the offensive coordinator and Jared Parker last year, I do think the younger players got a little bit of both worlds. Carberry Q says, can a guy have an off day? Just wondering because everyone is saying how good Carr was against the twos and threes, but Angeli balls out in a real game and it is swept under the rug because it wasn't the full team. Oh, and I know what SMDH means. Okay. <laughs> I, I have I have a 15-year-old grandson. He clues me in on what those things. Shaking I had my to head. Ask, I, yeah, shaking my head. <laughs> yeah, I had to ask him when I heard the women's basketball players calling each other bro, I said, is that common or is this you know, <laughs> grandpa? It's, the girls do it all the time. I said, okay. <laughs> so anyways, to the back question of this. Yeah. A guy can have an off day. I, I don't think that you want him on game days and so forth, but I mean, you have to take all these things into the picture. When you evaluate Steve Angeli, you have to evaluate how good, good he did in the Sun Bowl. I mean, that's the highest pass efficiency rating by a Notre Dame quarterback in his debut in the last 50 years. So now what was the second best? Sam Hartman's performance against Navy and the third best was Ron Paulus's against Northwestern. Did that portend what was going to happen in their careers? Not necessarily, but it's a great place to start. But I do think, again, going against a defense like that, I think, not only is good for our evaluation, it's good for Steve Angeli to see that and say, okay, here's what I need to work on. So we're not saying, we're not sweeping anything under the rug. We're saying, okay, let's see how Steve responds to that. Uh, because he may come out in the blue-gold game and learned a lot from that experience and be better for it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, like, there we have to do both things, right? We have to tell you what happened Saturday, right? We we can't just say Steve Angeli was amazing and CJ Carr stunk because that's the order of the depth chart. We got to tell you what, how they played. Obviously, then you have to tell give that with, within the proper perspective of what that means. Um, and I think that's what we're trying to do. I hope Carberry Q uh, doesn't think we're being unfair. I, I think you can see that from fans. are like, okay, let's, let's the CJ Carr era. Let's get rolling. People get excited to get ahead of themselves. I mean, it's a cliche, but no one's more popular than the backup quarterback, right? Like everyone wants to see the next guy. Except for right? Tyler James. <laughs> At quarterback. <laughs> so um, I think that I, I certainly I'm not unseating uh, Steve Angeli for CJ Carr right now. Um, and I, I think that's fair to say, hey, Steve Angeli deserves some respect for what he was able to do in the bowl game when it really mattered versus uh, what happened in the Saturday scrimmage. But it's not 
Like that, Steve Angeli can't go into fall camp and say, "Hey, you remember what I did in the Sun Bowl?" Like that, that it doesn't stop. Like you got to keep progressing um, and, and uh, keep making a, um, uh, your, yourself better and, and figuring out uh, how how to uh, push for that starting job. Um, Ron Robert said, "Well, first he said he wanted to tell uh, us how much he enjoyed the podcast with Michael McCann." Which, if you haven't listened to that, go check that out on all your favorite podcast listening uh, devices. Um, and I appreciate that. And Michael McCann is an expert on, on NIL, all the court cases with the NCAA, the student athlete model, and he's way smarter than us. So we were happy to have him on. Yeah. And, and so Ron's questions uh, were, I may have missed it, but why did Clarence Lewis decide to enter the portal and what has stopped Tyson Ford from failing to achieve success, which I think he is dealing with leaving, which I think is why he is dealing with leaving. Sorry, I did a bad job of reading that, Marat, Ron. Let's start with Tyson Ford first. So Tyson was not at the Jersey scrimmage Saturday when Marcus Freeman was asked about it after the scrimmage and the post-practice press conference. He said he's taking some personal time to think about his future. And so, yeah, he could be in the portal tomorrow when it opens, or he could decide to stay at Notre Dame. And he has continually made the decision to this point to stay. We have not seen him move up the depth chart yet at Notre Dame. We've seen him move sideways. We've seen him move to different positions. And certainly in last year's blue goal game, he he actually looked pretty good. He had a burst. He played a little inside. He played some field end and looked pretty decent. And again, maybe bouncing back and forth hasn't helped him, but he has not been able to push up the depth chart why? I, I think maybe, again, bouncing back between positions has mm -hmm. hurt him. But there's some pretty good guys in front of him. You know, I mean, you have an All-American at nose guard. You have a guy who has NFL skills playing next to him at defensive tackle. Then you kind of go to the next level. And Gabe Rubio will be back. He'd start for a lot of teams. Mm -hmm. Jason Anye is a beast. And Donovan Heinish is a typical Heinish. I mean, that's going to be super productive and surprise everybody because he was a three-star recruit. They should just automatically give anybody with the Heinish last name the fourth star, knowing that uh, whatever gauge was given him the three stars was the wrong one. So there are a lot of good players. Brennan Vernon's in the mix in the middle in the middle. You have Devin Houston and uh, Sean Savalano Jr. at nose guard who are really showing out. And so I think, in my opinion, Tyson Ford may have had a clearer path had he stayed at field end, and that may have been the best place for him. But right now there's three really good athletes sitting there with Aiden Gobira on the injury list ready to compete as soon as he gets back. So um, that's my best assessment is, you know, there's just been really good people and he hasn't been able mm -hmm. to push, push past them. Yeah. And to, I, 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 there's nothing much more for me to add on that, on the Tyson Ford front in terms of Clarence Lewis. Like we, I don't think he made any sort of comments about why he left, but it, it seems pretty clear that he was basically just recruited over um, in terms of like Jordan Clark is playing the role that Clarence Lewis was hoping that he would play. And, as Jordan Clark uh, got healthy this spring and and started to clearly show himself as the number one nickelback for Notre Dame, that that left Clarence Lewis continuing to fight for reserve roles. You're talking about a position where he was, if you're looking at the outside cornerback roles, he's the Notre Dame's fourth cornerback. So a guy that's played four years at Notre Dame. Wants and to, has been a starter. Yeah, and wants to finish his career playing. Um, it makes sense for him to enter the portal. The, weird, the only thing weird about – the Lewis thing is when he decided that, and that, that makes me believe that sort of watching Clark's development sort of said, you know what, let me let me uh, step back, and there's no reason for me to see the rest of the spring through because I, the writing was was on the wall for for Clarence Lewis because Clark was the the main addition there, given that uh, he was a transfer addition um, this off season from Arizona State. All right, we can get back on track. We'll get some more questions in uh, when we talk some portal and recruiting stuff later. Okay, so we discussed our 
scrimmage observations in our takeaway show on Saturday, which is available on YouTube, thanks to the thousands of people that have watched it so far. <laughs> and it has been. Thousands. What if it was just 10 people who watched it hundreds of times? It, it could have been. And I, w- <laughs> I would yell at my mom for doing that, <laughs> even though she's in her 90s. <laughs> no, I, I definitely more than tens of you. I'm just, I'm just, just joshing. Okay, so, but let's take a deeper dive in a couple of areas, particularly on defense. We saw some players lining up in some niche roles. Marcus Freeman talked about fitting and adapting the scheme around the players in the press conference, not forcing the players into the scheme. Do you like this approach, and who might benefit from this approach, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's absolutely what you should do at the college level, especially it's not... It's not the NFL where you can sort of go fill specific needs or draft by by like profile. Like obviously Notre Dame is doing some of that in recruiting and trying to address needs, but you don't get whoever you want. Like it's 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 a different process uh, than the NFL. You have like you you get to try to put the resources in and getting guys, but you never know, and some guys don't don't pan out, and you can't really base your um, count on getting guys to fill specific roles. I think that's been one of the things Notre Dame has had some trouble with it with the Viper position is that it's a very sort of different role than like a traditional defensive end. And then people get upset that they're not getting Viper recruits, but it's like, well, they're kind of recruiting some linebacker recruits with the idea that those guys will end up being Vipers. And I don't know that you could say it's a success necessarily. Joshua Burnham's, I think going to be the guy, maybe not as a Viper, but as a defensive end that could have the chance to have the, the most success um, in this current sort of regime. Uh, so I think those are the kinds of things that you should do when you're uh, coaching and recruiting. Um, I think Jalen Sneed, someone that benefits from that, they use him in different ways. Jaden Osbury could be someone that benefits from that. Um, I think even Kingston Villiamuasa, we saw lining up in some, some like blitzing pass rusher situations, right. um, benefit from that. So I think probably the linebackers more than anything else, I, I think there could be some DBs that could take advantage of that and when you're talking about nickel and dime packages and stuff like that. And even some defensive ends, right? If you bring defensive ends in and put them in at defensive tackles and pass row situations and stuff like that, I think there are ways to, to sort of take advantage of that. Is there any other guys that you were thinking of specifically? I thought you hit them pretty good. Osbury is a guy that I talked to and did a feature on last week, and he mentioned that They've got him playing the Aztec role, which is what DJ Brown played, who's a, who was a safety, um, playing that role. They had him working a little bit at nickel. I don't think we'll see him a lot there. They had him playing straight safety. Um, they also had him playing rover, and they have him playing inside, and they have him rushing the passer. You, you have a lot of really athletic linebackers, so I agree with you. I think d- take advantage of it. You know, mm-hmm. those guys all want to play. They can play. Kingston Villiamuasa has, you know, come in and he looks like a college linebacker and he yeah. studies like a college linebacker, and that's helped him. But we knew this next wave of linebackers, more athletic linebackers, was coming, and I think it's pretty cool that they're taking advantage of it. I'm I'm curious what they will do on the defensive line in terms of getting more pass rushers on the field. But I could see even Botello – kicking inside and maybe with Riley Mills or somebody else inside and having Bubakar Traore uh, rush from that fighter end spot because he really seems to be good. I I didn't notice Bubakar as much in run plays, but I did notice him in the pass rush. He showed up. For sure. So okay. Um, one and thing, the, one thing I want to mention, I, and I know we 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 have some spots to talk about safeties later, but I don't know if we'll get to it. Um, the Jay Osbury Aztec role. Do you think that like my thought is like once Rod Hurd gets here, wouldn't Adon Schuler be that guy? Like I, m- that's my question is like with another safety that can actually play that they feel confident in. Does that take some of that? N- defensive back almost role uh, from Jaden Osbury sort of away from him. I'm not sure in talking with Jaden, there are times he and Adon are on the field at the same time. And you're right. If Rod Hurd is here and he's ahead of Adon, does Adon just slide over and take, um, take the role of Osbury? Osbury's a 
interesting guy. I went back and looked at some of my early interviews with him, and he runs in the four 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 five range. At least when he got on campus, he was six foot about two oh five. He is now six two two twenty. Um, so he's he's taller, um, and he still can run really well. He's played inside and outside. He was actually the middle linebacker on his team as a senior down in Baton Rouge on that U high team that's right on the LSU campus. Um, but he's he has a background with defensive backs too. He's played a lot of positions like Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa did. When they were recruiting him, that's whose film they showed him. And they said, this could be you. Um, and so he's trying to be an every down Viper, or not a Viper, a Rover as well. Notre Dame hasn't had that since Jeremiah Wusu Koromoa. So you're right. I mean, it, it could be, but I think Notre Dame is trying to prepare for every eventuality. What if now with Clarence Lewis gone, if Jordan Clark gets hurt, right? does it make sense to move Rod Hurd over there and then keep, as well as Adon Schuler has been playing and Luke Talich to an extent, uh, making that move instead of running Michael Bell out there at 177 pounds. The one thing that, and I get, and again, it may have to do with the opponent, you know, mm -hmm. Adon Schuler lost weight and got down into the high 190s, I think, or he's around 200. Osbury's 220, so if you want that bigger body, you know, he could still fit into that. Yeah, and we, and we did see Adon get uh, trucked by Jeremiah Love, unfortunately. On Adon's <laughs> behalf, uh, Jeremiah Love ran him over and leaped over him. That was in that highlight package that uh, someone referenced earlier. I can actually put that here on, uh, in the in the comments um, once, we, once Eric starts talking next. Um, let's grab a couple of these questions that were, that were related from Saturday. Uh, Carberry Q asked, so how did the offense offensive line look Saturday? I thought it was functional and that's about it. You know, I, I mm -hmm. didn't feel like, you know, I felt like there were some mistakes here and there. I mean, the defense had their way with it. It didn't look like, you know, a high school team playing against a college team, but you think about RJ Oban and. Howard Cross and Riley Mills and Jordan Batello. And then you just throw in the second line of defensive linemen and front seven players, linebackers. It's it's a tough, tough go. But I thought they looked okay, uh, but they were clearly the position group, as we highlighted, that has the most to prove. And where I take – from it the most is Mike Denbrock seems to be happy with the way that they're progressing. And again, you have two positions still where you have, or two players that are not starters right now that are in competition. One is Rocco Spindler, which Marcus Freeman hinted that once he gets a hundred percent, which he's close, but once he gets a hundred percent this summer, then Rocco will really have a chance to overtake somebody in the interior. And then Emil Wagner and uh, Tosh Baker at the right tackle. So you're trying to form cohesion, but you're also trying to do these player competitions and get your best five out on the field. Yeah, I thought I thought the offensive line was solid in run run blocking. We it was more pass he pass heavy than run heavy. I think for the most part. Um, the second offensive line struggles and that's pretty consistent. Like, especially in spring, you're not going to see like a second offensive line unit look really good. Um, Sam because, Pendleton had some low snaps. Yeah. Pendleton. Yeah. That, that, that didn't help matters that Sam Pendleton as the number two center was struggling with some snapping accuracy. Um, and it's just like the second defensive line that Notre Dame has plays regularly on Saturdays. Whereas these, the second string offensive line. Some of those guys have barely played at all in their career, even right. in even in cleanup duty. So um, it's just a different level because of the experience and playing time that, that's available. Um, so why don't you tell them who's on the second string offensive line? Just yeah, second case. string uh, from Saturday was left tackle. I'm doing this off the top of my head. Sullivan Absher, right. left left guard, Rocco Spindler, center Sam Pendleton, right guard uh, Ty Chan. And right tackle Emil Wagner, right. 
Um, and uh, so then I think that they have a deep defense or offensive line because I think they went three deep with basically one a new guy at every spot. So they did um, that. That might be a position where maybe someone Chan, is- I think might have played tackle in the third team. Yeah, I think but, he he's done some tackle and guard this spring, and um, they, they they but they yeah they have a lot of numbers there, and I wouldn't be so terribly surprised if someone hits the portal from from that position group just because of so many numbers. But um, I think there's a lot of guys that think they have a chance to play in the future as well. Right, and they do bring in a really good one in June and Gary Lambert. Right. Um. Let's see. Yeah. Uh... Joe Long, I think Joe was chirping about Jack Kaiser in a previous one, so I wanted to bring this up. Joe says, I think we're going to lose a very good linebacker by keeping Jack Kaiser, and I'd much rather keep our young linebacker studs. Do you agree with that? I disagree with it. And I think, uh, Joe, maybe the I, – I don't even know that's true about the 2023 version of Kaiser – and pro football focus isn't the end all be all, but he was the highest rated defensive player by their film grades on Notre Dame's defense last season. And he's been in the top five the last two or three years. So, um, and I think you're getting a better version of Jack Kaiser this year. And one who's really going to help those young guys around him. He's up into the mid 230s with his weight. He's kept his speed with that. He gets a half step because he can read offenses so well and read plays so well. Max Boa, I'm glad I didn't call him Shane or Hank. Max <laughs> Boa really um, felt like from December to the start of spring that Jack Kaiser was the most improved linebacker on the roster. What he's saying now is that Jalen Sneed is the most locked in linebacker and we're seeing a lot of improvement for him. And I think a lot of the, he's making the players around him better. So I'm going to disagree with you, Joe, and you can throw something at your computer. <laughs> he's throwing comments in. Uh, I, I, I want to respond to the, the comment here that Joe's talking about young linebackers. I, I were, you're miss assigning people here. Uh, press because he says Preston Zinner, Kingston, Villiama, Asa, Jalen Sneed, Drake Bowen, Jay Nosberry, Bubakar Traore. Traore is a defensive end. He's a Viper. So Jack Kaiser playing isn't inhibiting his role. Um, Drake Bowen is playing alongside Jack Kaiser, so he's not hurting J Drake Bowen. Um, Sneed, you can make the argument for, like, are you going to not play Jack Kaiser because you have Preston Zinter on the roster? I, I don't know. Like, that seems like a stretch to me. Your third string Mike linebacker, as is. Um, Preston Zinter is getting passed up by Kingston, it looks like. So. Um, I think we're, um, I think you're over exaggerating the impact that Jack Kaiser is having on the ability to play other linebackers at Notre Dame. Um, I think Jack's going to have a play an important role for Notre Dame. Um, and I think they're going to work in ways to play those guys. I don't think there's the confidence in all those guys to be as well-rounded as Jack Kaiser has been. Um, and Notre Dame hopes will continue to be going into the season. Joe, are we can clink our glasses together while having a beer is there's something to be excited about the young linebackers. There's some real talent there. Um, Let's see. Scott Fegan asked, uh, do you see this incoming group team being the best depth we've seen since Lou Holtz? I know our coaches certainly may be the best since the Holtz era. I would say it certainly has the chance to be, I'm trying to think about in my mind, I mean, there have been certain positions, but when you look at every position on both sides of the ball, you feel pretty good about the depth. You know, it's at some positions, I'm wondering about the top of the depth chart. So that's not your question. You're saying, you know, if somebody at the top got hurt, would would you be able to move them up and feel pretty good? Would you be able to rotate in? And I'd say at most positions right now, I would feel pretty good about who's coming up, especially after as well as the secondary played on Saturday with no Ben Morrison in there. That was amazing. Yeah, I I, I mean, I don't feel comfortable comparing anything to the whole Tara. Um, so, and even 
some of the eras that came between the Holtz era and the Brian Kelly era, which is when the I Holtz era had the difference makers at the top of the depth chart too. I mean, you have a had a lot of draft picks, a yeah. lot of first rounders in that era. Yeah, anytime we do draft coverage, it's like the first time someone's been drafted this high since someone that played for Louisville. Yeah. That's usually always what it is if someone gets drafted high. So uh, I think that's hard to do. But yeah, in terms of like those eras that came since, like I was saying, like Brian Kelly is the first era that I covered, and I was I started a couple years into his tenure. Um, so I can't speak with extreme uh, knowledge of the Willingham and Davy eras and the Weiss eras, but. Um, I, I, I know the product that was on the field. I wasn't necessarily watching practices and uh, getting in-depth looks at it like someone who was covering the team. But um, it does seem like Notre Dame is putting itself in a better and better position um, with, with the building of the depth um, and the talent they're consistently recruiting um, at positions right. all over the place. There's definitely room to improve still, but um, they're doing a, a good job of improving all over the place. The, the recruiting has been – has picked up the player development model is still still very good, but you have to throw the transfer portal in there. You're able to fill some holes, both depth wise and starters wise, with the transfer portal. I mean, Notre Dame got what eight in the eight scholarship guys this winter, so that that certainly helps your depth. All right. Um, I think we're good good uh, in front in terms of stuff about the current team and the practice um, from Saturday. Is there anything else uh, from Saturday you want to discuss, Eric? In terms of questions I'm talking about, sorry. Um, I think we can go on to, to Saturday here. Um, there was some news, some personnel updates during the post-practice presser. What did we learn about Jaden Thomas, Jaden Harrison, oh, yeah. and Tyson Ford? Well, we talked about Tyson Ford, so just the Jadens. This is a non-Tyson <laughs> Jaden only report. Jaden with a Y too. Uh, so no great house updates here. Um, Jaden Thomas uh, has been dealing with a hamstring issue. I've noticed in spring practices that we've been at that he um, has not been participating in everything. Like he goes out and warms up and then he's at sort of the back of the line for, for uh, individual drills. And then when they do some seven on seven or scrimmage, he hasn't been partaking in that would continue to be the case. And Marcus Freeman, let us know that he's been dealing with a hamstring, which is discouraging because that is what kept Jaden Thomas out for so much time um, last fall. So hopefully it's more precautionary and they're just being ex extra sensitive to him given his track record last year and he can get back because I think there's a lot of potential from Jaden Thomas. Um, he's an important piece for the wide receiver group if he can be healthy. Uh, the other one is Jaden Harrison. Uh, he's been dealing with a strained plantar fascia in his left foot. Um, he will be out for the rest of the spring. We last week we saw him at a couple of practices with a boot on and was able to get clarity from Marcus Freeman on what he's dealing with. So tough news for Jaden Harrison, the transfer from Marshall, who had been having a good spring by all accounts and what we had seen, um, a very explosive player, someone that will impact Notre Dame's wide receiver group and uh, especially the kick return unit as well as a former All-American at Marshall. One last little thing about Saturday. Did was there anybody that surprised you that we haven't talked about yet? Um, I I don't. I guess. Uh, well, I don't remember who brought him up in the chat last week. Uh, Sean Savellano. Someone said that someone called him a duck out of water. I don't. I don't. And that person didn't throw whoever said that under the bus because that didn't make sense to us. But uh, he had a sack in the game. That wasn't. So that was. Uh, uh, or the scrimmage. Um, so seeing that was good. That was a bit of a surprise. He was rotating in, uh, with the third string nose tackle. It was Sean Savalano and Devin Houston were sharing time. Um, Cooper Flanagan. I don't know that we've talked a lot about him. We, we spend more time talking about Mitchell Evans and Eli Raritan and their guys that are, haven't been fully healthy and been practicing, but he's like, if Notre Dame had to go out and play with Cooper Flanagan as the starting tight end, I think they'd be fine. I think he's a very dependable guy. I don't know that he's very explosive necessarily, um, and he's going to make a lot of big plays, but I think he's mm -hmm. continuing to improve and try to, to be a dependable guy that you could throw to on third downs and have confidence in. But um, I really like him. So when people are like, what about taking a tight end in the portal? I was like, what? I, I don't know. To do what? I don't I, I don't know. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but um, I like I, I like and continue like what we've seen from Cooper Flanagan. We mentioned Adon Schuler a little bit. I just His interception was, 
was very impressive and it's someone who's been uh i've been high on all spring so i just wanted to highlight that as well um i feel like there was someone as soon as we got done recording our post scrimmage takeaways i was like oh i forgot to mention him but i don't even remember who that was now so i should have written that down um is there anyone that we haven't talked a lot about that you want to highlight eric no i mean i'll I'll circle back to cam williams because he's been fairly quiet and that was kind of the loudest that i've seen him be in terms of his play and he was we're like okay yeah, he had There's something. Another going, one. He had something going with CJ Carr, which is the right guy to be. Yeah, as, as fellow friends. They took, an, they took <laughs> enough visits together, so yeah, they yeah. ought to have some kind of chemistry. So if you're gonna have chemistry with someone, that be the guy that's in your class and uh, um, someone that's probably not not the four string quarterback for very long either. So the spring version of the transfer portal opens Tuesday and stays open until April 30th. Players with grad transfer status can transfer at any time, as Clarence Lewis showed. That's uh, why he was able to leave at Easter break. Notre Dame is at 90 scholarships. They would need to be at the NCAA max of 85 by the first day of fall semester classes, which I believe is August 27th. Not knowing who those five will be, Tyler, do we think there's a need to add to a position group before the attrition begins. Um, I'm a broken record on the offensive tackle front. If there's someone who can be a starting offensive tackle for Notre Dame uh, in College Station, I think Notre Dame should look into that. Um, There might not be a person that that fits that bill um, that they think is better than Charles Jagusa or um, Tosh Baker. But uh, if that person does exist, I think that would be worth entertaining. I think cornerback is something that you would like to have maybe a depth guy for like, that's like replacing Clarence Lewis is essentially what you're trying to do, which might not be easy to do. Um, And I think uh, the fact that Notre Dame sent out a preferred walk-on offer to Cornell's Anthony Chideme Alfaro is maybe an indication that Notre Dame's trying to add some more depth there at cornerback and they might not be able to a lot of scholarship for it. We'll see what happens with that. But I think those are probably the two positions that I would have some interest in. What about you? Only if, uh, besides the offensive tackle and cornerback, I I definitely think that you want to be monitoring those, especially if you have somebody, an unexpected departure at those positions. You definitely want to look at that. I'm, I'm open to them looking at a tight end, but only if you're, really concerned that you're not going to get Evans and Bauman back. I think if they're getting one or the other, that's enough, Mm -hmm. especially with Notre Dame playing maybe fewer multiple tight end sets. I I think there are a lot of good tight ends. I know that Mike Denbrock mentioned that Jack Larson's head was swimming and that it's hard to get him lined up in the right place, but he was really impressed with Flanagan. Eli Reardon has been full go the last few practices. So, again, unless you think Evans isn't going to come back until October and Bauman might not come back ever, then I think Notre Dame is in a pretty good place. And it it would be a hard sell to a tight end unless, again, it was just kind of a depth guy and then are you really adding a whole lot? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I do I do like Cooper Flanagan. He's, he has surprised me. Um, with how he's been able to improve. He played in all 13 games last year, started the last two games, including the bowl game, played 41 snaps in that game. So, okay. Yeah, I Marcus, got here, right before you go on, a uh, sure. portal question from Frank Serra, who we know loves to ask about portal guys all the time. He says he sees a defensive lineman from Pittsburgh Panthers in the portal. Do you think ND would be interested? And to be, fr- to be frank, Frank, I'm not sure who this person is that Frank is talking about specifically, but. Um, well, if it's Aaron Donald, yes. <laughs> if it's anybody but that, I don't know who they're going to beat out. Um, there's a lot of depth and a lot of good players at Notre Dame. I I know that Pittsburgh has had some good defensive linemen, even on teams that got beat by 50 points by Notre Dame. They've had some good ones, but I I would I would not think they're in the market for a defensive lineman, even if Tyson Ford hits the portal. Yeah, so I'm looking it up while you were talking. Dave Dayon Hayes is the name. Uh, he 
I don't know if this is his stats last year or career stats, but it says he has 25 and a half tackles for a loss and 12 sacks. That's a per our, the, our at rivals portal account. Um, I would think that's career that they usually do career 12 and a half sacks. He would have been an all American. Right. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm thinking as well. Just, but I, I didn't, I don't know that off the top of my head and he's a fifth year uh, according to this. So he would be a graduate. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know who you would like, you would have to, if you're going to, rec- that guy's expecting to start somewhere, right? You get, so are you, who are you recruiting him over? Are you saying thanks to RJ Oban, but no thanks? Or like Jordan Botello, like we're moving on from you. I just don't see that um, happening. So I don't, I don't necessarily expect Notre Dame to be very active in like the top end defensive, defensive end market right now. So Marcus Freeman talked about his philosophy of not wanting to wait for an exit interview situation or a post spring practice sit down, but being in constant communication with his players in part because that's what leaders do and in part to prevent surprises and misunderstandings, misreads. Do you think that's working for him and the Irish, that approach? Yeah, I think so. Um, but like being aware of things and preventing things is sort of a different, like a different thing, right? Like you might understand or be clear with kids, but you can still like disagree with their decisions or um, do everything you can to do that. And just some things, you, I mean, you can't control what a kid is going to do. Um, but yeah, I think it seems like they're doing everything right in terms of being transparent with guys. Um, I mean, Gino Gadulli was like, Hey, we're, we're Notre, we're, we're Notre Dame. I'm recruiting high level quarterbacks. I don't need to tell them what the depth chart is. Like they know what it is based on what's happening in practice, what the grades are, the the feedback they're getting. Like I don't, they don't need to have their names listed in specific order to have a sense of where they are in the pecking order. And that's the coaches should be. Um, maybe if there's guys that are lower down that the coaches are, very high and in the future they can say like hey we know this is what you need where you're at now but this is what you can do to improve and this is what we see of you in the future so there's ways to do that but um Notre Dame lost some significant names last spring so um I, I I'm not predicting like major names to necessarily leave but I, I I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if some guys left that maybe we wouldn't be talking about now that's different than us talking about and the coaching staff talking about maybe the coaching staff Feels like they know what what who's going to go, and we'll be surprised by guys that they they already knew about. Right. Well, last year we certainly had some interesting ones post spring with Logan Diggs and right Tyler Buckner, and we had one pre Blue Gold game in Lorenzo Styles who got flipped to cornerback, did interviews with us, and then hit the portal. That was a bizarre one. But but I. I'm curious, Tyler, if you look at it a year later, do you think Lorenzo Styles would be competing for a starting spot at corner this spring? Oh, no, no. Yeah, I agree. I mean, he could be that, he would be that Clarence Lewis role. Like if Clarence left, yeah. then, then he's that maybe fourth cornerback and not having experience, but at least someone with talent. I haven't checked in with what Lorenzo has been doing in terms of cornerback development at Ohio State, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to see him passing Jaden Mickey and and Christian Gray, right? I, it would be hard for me to anticipate him being ahead of those guys. Absolutely. So we have recruiting left on the docket to get to. We can get to a few questions before we do that. And if Joe Long is trash-talking me, we can get to that. Too. <laughs> I don't think Joe is. It, uh <laughs> Joe just said, I'm thinking of subscribing to the website, but I'd fight with Tyler too much. I think <laughs> I can't like I can't answer all of Joe's questions when we're talking about the Viper position. I think there's just some confusion about what we're talking about in terms of the positions. And uh, I just don't think Bubakar Traore is like his role is not being impacted by Jack Kaiser. They're not they're not being asked to do the same things. Um, but as for another question from Brian was, do you think Notre Dame is trying for a higher level of quarterbacks for under Freeman or are Andy's records for the last 10 to 12 years attracted at a higher level of quarterback recruit? Um, Since this was addressed to me, I can start. I think, I think they are. I think Notre Dame had been my biggest complaint with Notre Dame's quarterback recruiting under Brian Kelly was that it seemed like they were 
will it, they got like complacent like if they would get one four star guy in one class they were like okay we don't need to we'll we we'll, we'll be fine with getting a three star guy in the next class and they were sort of anticipating maybe like hey this guy is going to be our starter we don't need to go out and get someone to challenge him for the next season and i don't think it was always intended that way but i just feel like their name wasn't working ahead enough and getting ahead um and getting in good position with those top end quarterbacks so a lot of times they'd end up with three star guys in classes you end up with a brendan clark um, Ian Book was that, and obviously Ian Book far outplayed that in uh, his recruitment. It, his career was better than um, his three-star label as a recruit. Um, but I think this staff has been very proactive. Like, they got C.J. Carr. They were pounding the trail to get Deuce Knight. They got Deuce Knight. They're pounding the trail to get a top 2026 20, quarterback. They are being aggressive. And I think it's smart because – even if you recruit those three-star guys, they're going to leave too. So why not get the best of the best? And so whatever you're left with is the best of the best. Like you're going to have, you're going to have quarterback transfers and it's not necessarily always going to be the three-star guy. It could be some of the top end guys. Um, and so I think you have to get good guys in every cycle. So I think Notre Dame was trying to get high end guys. Like I think there was a question, whether it was a on YouTube or our, our podcast previously about, is Notre Dame going after higher quarterback recruits now um, than like the past two recruiting cycles? And I didn't necessarily think that was the case because one, Notre Dame got CJ Carr and Deuce Snyder are highly ranked guys, um, but they went after some other highly ranked guys in those classes as well. Um, so I think that um, Notre Dame is just in a spot here where it doesn't have a, have a commitment and they have had the, the luxury of being able to go after these top end guys because they do have someone committed in the class ahead of them. Um, so the quarterback recruiting is in a really good spot. I mean, a better spot than any time I've covered Notre Dame, in my personal opinion. Um, and that's I started in 2012 full time. Uh, so I think the Notre Dame's doing a really good job with, with the quarterback recruits. I would say the one guy that was really went for the top quarterbacks and got them was Charlie Weiss. He he did have a run of Jimmy Clausen. Dane Christ, who was a five star, I know it didn't work out. Demetrius Jones, Zach Frazier. I mean, he he was able to bunch them up. Guys were really eager to play for Charlie because he coached Tom Brady at New England, but he couldn't get defensive tackles um, and linebackers until he got Manti right at the end. Um, and I'm not sure that Manti's decision was weighted by Charlie being the head coach, but. Um, I think this has been really consistent quarterback recruiting, and that's probably a sh more in depth for a show the other day. But Tyler hit it well, so you asked the right guy of the two of us. <laughs> uh, is you thirty nine asked? Did you did the team show any twenty one sets on Saturday? Advantage of twenty one over eleven, given the running back talent this year. I don't remember seeing one, but I was watching the line a lot with my binoculars, and we were high enough up that. I had my binoculars on my face most of the time. I, I I don't think we'll see them show that much in the blue gold game if they show it at all, but I do think we will see it in the fall. Because of how they've cross-trained Jeremiah Love, I could see you being able to get mismatches with Jeremiah Love and another running back, and Jeremiah Love getting a linebacker on him, and you go, ooh, throw it to four. Right. Yeah, I don't. I don't recall any twenty-one sets. I don't think they did that because um, I feel like that would have stood out. I would have. I would have noticed that, um, but I was not taking detailed personnel notes necessarily. It happens fast enough as is, and you don't have a replay monitor or anything. So you're conferring with the guys you're sitting next to, like, "Hey, who caught that? Who made the tackle? What what, what happened there?" Um, so uh, did not have a lot of notes on that, but yeah, I don't think I saw that. I, the The positive thing is that Notre Dame really likes its slot receivers. Um, and Mike Denbrock talked a little about and referenced some of the stuff he did at LSU, that they're going to be aggressive with the slot position. If you can get a really good receiver in your slot role, even if it's a nickelback, you're still the odds that the nickelback is the best guy at covering on the field is probably slim, right? Like nickelbacks end up being your third best cornerbacks rather than your first best cornerback more often than not, uh, at least at the college level, maybe at the NFL level, there might be some really advanced nickelback players, but um your Notre Dame is going to try to take advantage of that with Mike, Mike Denbrock as the offensive coordinator. So 
Um, there will be opportunities for someone like Jeremiah Love, like Eric was talking about. Um, and I think they will do some 21 stuff to to do some different looks. Um, it wasn't a 21 look, but the the touchdown run that Kenny Minchie had was a bit of a creative sort of RPO look where it was a fake handoff to because I think Minchie was in with the ones at this point because then Jaden Greathouse came in, came in like jet motion. There was a fake to him, and I think he had Cooper Flanagan as an option to throw it to, and then Minchie just runs it in for a six-yard touchdown because – how do you guard all those guys, right? Uh, so uh, it, wor- it worked in Notre Dame's favor, and that, I think that's some of the creativity that, you, that you'll see from Mike Denbrock's offense. Okay, do we want any more questions, or are we going to do a lightning round with recruiting here? Uh, let's do a lightning round rec- with recruiting. I don't think we have any other questions. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's all the questions I had in my star queue. So Notre Dame is, as I mentioned earlier in the show, is going to have its legacy weekend, which is going to be scads of former Notre Dame football players on campus, both for the blue gold game, but also to talk to recruits and current players and some functions they have the two days before the blue gold game. There's going to be lots of blue gold game visitors. What's the significance of the group that's coming in that we know of so far on Saturday? Yeah, I think it'll be more 2026 focused than 2025 focused, um, which is sort of the theme of the latter half of spring recruiting for Notre Dame because they're so far ahead in the 2025 class. They're just sort of putting With some how of, many commitments? Uh, I think it's 19. 19? I think it's 19. Um, and the biggest 2025 name will be wide receiver Javon Boggs. He plans to get up here, former Ohio State commit, four star recruit, uh, teammates with. Notre Dame 2026 quarterback target Brady Hart at Coco High in Florida. Um, And Javon's father was, I think, a teammate of Marcus Freeman's in high school, so there's an extra connection there. Um, So getting him on campus will be important. There will be some other 2025 visitors during the week. James Simon, a running back out of Louisiana, is planning to be on campus on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, And Josh Petty, a four-star offensive tackle, is planning to be on campus on Wednesday. Um, so, So those are the big... 2025 visitors that we're aware of as of now we'll do some more reporting uh, on the insider lounge and with a visitors preview later this week on who all is expected to be here um, for the game this Saturday with what we expect to be a very 2026 heavy list. I believe you submitted a future cast in the last week. Tell us about your clairvoyance and who the uh, guy is and how excited should Joe Long be. (laughs) <laughs> Jay, you're really picking on joe or making me I, i'm picking on joe i'm sorry joe. Um, just making sure you're paying attention <laughs> uh tristan haynes is the cornerback out of oklahoma that notre dame feels really good about i think he, him and his family drove up from oklahoma to make the visit uh to, to notre dame this past weekend um got up here on campus um heard positive things about how that visit went and uh he plans to get back for an official visit i'd I did some some digging in. Folks on the Oklahoma Omaha side of things believe that he is a candidate to potentially leave the state and not be sort of a, a Sooners like lock by any means. Um, so this is someone that adds some sort of competition to the Notre Dame's cornerback recruiting because Mark Zachary and Dallas Golden have sort of been like the guys that Notre Dame felt the best about, and I think they probably only have two more spots left. So. If Tristan Haynes wants in before them, I think that may leave one of those guys without a spot potentially. So um, maybe putting some pressure on some of those other guys. Um, but Tristan Haynes has not made a decision. He's not like a, a committed recruit to Notre Dame. So obviously there's still room for, for Notre Dame to keep recruiting those other guys. But Notre Dame seems to be in a very good position with cornerback recruiting right now. And Notre Dame has the number one class right now per rivals in the 2025 cycle. What's your – big piece of wisdom you'd like to impart as your last thought to leave a lasting impression that's not bigger than our one month subscription get three free but bigger than everything else we've said tonight um yeah i think in the 2025 class has been interesting very in a very quick amount of time here defensive line recruiting has gone dry like notre dame has has four commitments um in joseph reeve christopher burgess jr Dominic Kulak and Davion Dixon. 
but Notre Dame was looking to potentially add another defensive tackle and or another defensive end, and there's not really any realistic options left at those positions right now. So I think – A kid from Pittsburgh. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Notre Dame is going to need to sort of reevaluate where it stands with some of those guys. If there's guys that maybe they were on early that um, maybe they can flip, um, see what see what's up there, and if that's something they necessarily feel the need to do too. Like I, I think Notre Dame was looking at sort of some high-end guys there. So if they have to – take a step down and take a three-star guy. Is it worth doing that um, to fill out a class that already has four defensive line recruits? Um, so that's something that I'm keeping an eye on based on how things have been going the last, last couple of weeks. But otherwise it's been very positive, the 2025 class, but that is just one sort of a uh, trend that has emerged lately. Um, yeah. So I think that'll wrap it up for us. Uh, if you're not a subscriber to our website, make sure you take advantage of that promotion that Eric was talking about. We've kept it on the bottom of the screen whenever you're not asking questions tonight. Um, if you subscribe to the site, InsideNDSports.com, you can buy one month and get three additional months for free. All you have to do is use promo code NDSpring24 when you sign up to get access to our premium analysis and recruiting coverage and special access to us on the Insider Lounge where we spend a lot of our time and share our inside information first. There's a link to that. Um, you can sign up in the video description below. Um, and... Uh, if someone like Joe wants to come on and we could talk on the Lightning Star Lounge, we could talk about uh, defensive formations and and guys that are uh, com competing for different roles uh, on the defense. Uh, I'd be glad to talk talk more about that in in a, in a way that I can more, more direct, directly respond to you rather than trying to balance the show and and your comments at the same time. But I appreciate the passion and the opinions, Joe. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for everyone who stopped by tonight and uh, commented. Send it, send in questions. Just said hello. We appreciate all of you. Um, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit the like button. Um, share share the video with someone who's a Notre Dame fan that doesn't know about what we're doing here on Monday nights. Um, anything else you want to say before we go, Eric? Thanks to Legacy Heating and Air. Thanks for putting up with us. And make sure you watch our takeaway show after the Blue Gold game on Saturday evening. Oh, yeah. We'll do another uh, post-game takeaways. This will be, I guess... Considered a game, I, I, I took we branded as post game takeaways. So even the head, the header said post game takeaways, but it's really scrimmage takeaways. But we'll call it post game takeaways, and we enjoy doing that. And that's been a pretty popular feature for us. So we'll make sure we have that for your viewing pleasure after the Blue Gold game. Have a good week. <laughs>